All right, so I'd like to start off by uh, thanking the uh, LIDA and the uh, organizing committee for uh, this invitation to speak. Um, the goal of my presentation today um, is uh, both uh, included in my title, um, which is to uh, bring the, the audience here up to speed on, on this rapidly changing field of the study of the microbial uh, communities, uh, the, the microbes themselves that uh, we're finding in lungs both during health and disease, um, but then also identify the gaps, challenges, and, and uh, needs. And so to start with, um, I'd like to take you a little bit uh, back in history because I think this puts it in the context. And so this summer actually uh, pushes, uh, I was just thinking about this is the 10-year anniversary of when uh, my postdoc, uh, Mari Nover, in my lab um, was finishing studies uh, that, uh, that in which we were able to demonstrate using mice that if you, if you treated mice with an oral, poorly absorbed antibiotic, you could change immune responses in the lungs, a distal site. And the, the importance of that set of observations is because at that point, um, and uh, this idea of the study of the hygiene hypothesis, which by the way had its origins in the, uh, um, the study and of the etiology of allergic disease, um, one of the caveats is, um, let's see if I got a pointer here, here, is it had something to do with antibiotic use, so high antibiotic use, low antibiotic use, and this is coming on about 15 years or so of epidemiologic data that pointed stronger and stronger and stronger that antibiotic use correlated with the development of allergic disease, but not a single study that could actually demonstrate that that could be the case. And so that's what that was. The res interestingly, the results as I presented them were uh, uh, well received uh, at the meetings I was at, and we were actually asked to write a review on the topic. Okay, a review on a topic that never existed. That, that was actually quite an interesting challenge to us. So we kind of made it more of an opinion piece back then of like, okay, here's where the field stands, here's the epidemiology, what are the possible mechanisms that could, that, uh, this, uh, uh, could drive this? Since those studies, there have been now a number of studies that have come out um, that are all addressing the same issues and have shown the same sort of thing that whether you use poorly absorbed antibiotics or you use germ-free mice, that if you uh, disturb or, or alter the gut microbiome, the, the microbial interactions in the GI tract, you can change immune responses in the lungs, not just allergic, which is on this slide, but on also uh, immune responses to viruses. So the question was then, um, how does this work? And so uh, just a little interesting side note, um, so as we put these studies out uh, for uh, publication, um, uh, Nature turned, uh, their response was, these are not broadly applicable, uh, go away. So that was a 39-hour rejection. Uh, science did not send this out even for editorial review. Um, and later on, as we went through uh, review processes, this is the question that keeps coming up again and again, how does it work? Okay? And I love this slide, actually, from, uh, from Jacques and Larry's studies, and so Jacques showed the other day or yesterday, about the bouncing ball along, trying to get from one point to another. And this is basically how this field has moved for the past decade, which is as we try to go from one point here to trying to get to the question, how do things work, we've run into many obstacles. And when I say we, it's not just us, it's many other laboratories um, as we bounce around. And what are those obstacles? Well, the gap is trying to understand it. And the option, the obstacle, is the type of science we need to do when we're talking about distal site communication. And that's this idea that this is a complex in vivo system, and how do you get this by study sections in which they're dominated by reductionist biologists. And so I know I'm preaching to the choir here, because we deal with interdisciplinary research all the time and things like that, but this has been a huge, huge challenge to this field. And so, but we're not without ideas of how this works. And so the idea is that, uh, so um, as you inhale antigen, we know a lot about how immune responses develop in the lungs and, you, and, uh, and, and their outcome of that pulmonary challenge. But studies showed many years ago that sampling itself 
Um, it's hard to deliver something directly to the lungs, whether it's intranasally, inhalation, et cetera. Um, things get swept up and swallowed, and they go to the GI tract, where the immune system in the GI tract picks it up, and, and now, as a number of studies have been highlighted so far in this meeting um, about, uh, about the potential of immune regulation in the GI tract affecting sites, whether it be the lungs or the brain or whatever, the idea you can move around. Um, and then, of course, the idea that the microbiota might actually uh, influence how immune responses develop in the gut. We know that, or you know, the, a lot of studies here are, are talking about this for local responses, but then the, the potential that this could affect this immune regulation this way. But now, we're, there's more evidence coming out that microbial metabolites circulate. And so it opens the possibility that metabolites might also be affecting this response here. And there's actually a wonderful set of studies by uh, Brett, uh, by Ben Marsland um, at, uh, uh, um, in Switzerland, at Lausanne, that I've seen at meetings so far. Um, where he's looking at short-chain fatty acids um, and uh, um, their ability to affect pulmonary immune responses when delivered systemically. But one of the sets of reviews that came along during this whole process was, well, what, you know, are your antibiotics affecting the microbes in the lungs? Okay, well, besides the fact that these are poorly absorbed antibiotics and later on we've shown that it actually would not have any effect even on an infection, what a stupidly absurd question, okay, 10 years ago, because look at a textbook. The normal lung is free from bacteria, okay? And so, and in fact, is that one of the drivers that when you look at the Human Microbiome Project, there's nothing there in the lungs. There was no sampling of the lungs um, in the original surveys. And so, so the question about paradigm shifts is what I'm trying to focus on here. And so, a few years ago then, a landmark paper came out from Marcus Hilty and Bill Cookson um, over in England um, that actually showed that in asthmatic airways, well, first off, they showed that this is using a clone librase, uh, um, that in allergic disease, A, there was, you could isolate microbial signatures from the lungs of healthy individuals. They changed uh, during asthma. There was also some COPD data uh, in there. Um, and so, this is pretty fascinating. Um, and so since that point in time, um, there have been a number of diseases in which the lung microbiome has been reported to be altered. I put cystic fibrosis on here because actually that disease in and of itself has a really long history of having microbial colonization of the airways. And it, it kind of is cheating. It doesn't really count because we know that with all that mucus there, it really changes uh, the architecture and, and you've been able to culture a lot of things out. But for a lot of other diseases, culture-based um, processes have been, uh, fell short. But now we know in asthma, COPD, and in bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, syndrome that follows lung transplantation, that we can find altered microbial communities. So let me tell you a little bit then about airway anatomy, because this is very important when we talk about where are the microbes or where could they be. And so you need to realize that, that um, you that for anything that's coming down here, this tube, it starts in the mouth and the nasopharynx, so it's a, a fairly significant microbial load uh, up, up in the mouth and nose. And then it takes a 90 degree turn, okay? And then you head down the throat, you get a split, whether you go down the esophagus or into the lungs, um, and then the lungs begin to branch and branch and branch and branch. At the very end of those branches um, are the alveoli. Um, and so there is one little area here, so where the larynx is, I mean, potentially can serve as kind of a dam between the upper and lower airways. We know that there's cilia, um, ciliate epithelium that are pushing the mucus up, and there's lots of turns and branches, and in fact, it kind of, this is what the lung looks like. So you get this tree, and you get things that are uh, subject to gravity, some things, areas that are not. And actually, if you look at a diseased lung, we later on published a study looking at uh, explant lungs. So these are lungs that are pulled out of individuals that have advanced COPD, uh, to pull the tissue sterilely, look at different regions, and you can actually see regional heterogeneity in disease of actually the microbes that are growing there. So what are the so potential sources of microbes in the lungs? They include nasopharyngeal uh, aspiration, inhalation, the air is full of bacteria. Um, reflux and aspiration, um, and then probably only if, you're, uh, if there's a problem would you actually get microbes coming into the lungs via the bloodstream. So 
can lungs be considered sterile? And if so, what do we mean by sterile? In other words, is there, does it mean that they lack microbial exposure? Well, no way. I mean, they're at the end of the, they're the cul-de-sac at the end uh, of a very busy street. Um, of the microbes we find, is there actually microbial metabolism going on? Are they alive? Are they metabolizing? That's a question that we're, that is an active area of pursuit in this field. What about replication? We're finding microbes there. Are they actually replicating? So if they're alive or are they just persisting? Again, an unanswered question. And what about colonizers? Like in health, certainly in disease we can find them, but, and, but at what point in a transition from health to disease do we actually now get colonization? So it really raises a question. If, there's micro, if the lungs, the healthy lungs, are exposed all the time to microbes and microbial signatures, um, and there are live microbes going down there, what do we call this constant, this persistent low-grade flow of microbial immigrants into the lungs? What do we call this microbial flux? The microbiome of the lungs? So now how do you sample the airways? This is another issue in this field. So first off, you can, you can get sputum, which is basically a mucus plug in a sense. It's mucus from the sort of upper airways. It can come from a few branches down, but you hack it up. Okay, and it can be spontaneous or induced, so spontaneous is usually if you're sick, otherwise squirt some hypertonic saline in the back of your throat and you hack it up. Um, but then there's bronchovial lavage, so sticking a tube uh, down there to rinse out the airways. But in that, as you stick a bronchoscope down there, you could put a protected brush, so there's a little cap at the, uh, a little uh, waxy sort of plug that pops out as you get down there and you can brush the, the ep uh, epithelium. You could do a biopsy, either through the bronchoscope or you could come uh, potentially through the, uh, the chest cavity. Um, and then um, there's the concept of stereotitial sampling, which largely is only going to probably occur in either cadaverous lungs or ones removed for um, uh, um, lung transplant. So the gap is determining the degree of bacterial transience versus persistence versus colonization in the lower airways. And the challenges are the types of sampling. To study the lung, everything is invasive. Okay, so, so the rules are just different right from the get-go of how we can handle samples. Um, we can't do longitudinal sampling. I mean, when you stick a bronchoscope down there, um, with the exception of lung transplants where you do um, surveillance bronchoscopies, um, you, you, you can't really go more than two or three samplings in an individual over a period of a couple of years even. Um, and then of course, as mentioned, the bronchoscopes go through the nose, they go through the mouth. There's a the potential for contamination of samples from nasal or oral microbiota. And so um, a couple, to deal with that last one, a couple uh, uh, um, bioinformatic uh, options have been uh, put forward, which are very good. So one from uh, uh, Rick Bushman's lab on uh, using a single-sided outlier test, and another one that um, uh, Tom Schmidt and our group uh, is actively using, uh, and it's been published in the Lung HIV Microbiome Project, um, which is called the Neutral Community Model, which is, I mean, the idea is that you're at the end of a flow, okay? So how can you tell the difference between a scope going down or just what naturally flows down? Um, and then is there a selective pressure in that site? But you want to know what's down there? Well. This gives you kind of an idea. And so if we do a rinse uh, of the bronchoscope before it goes down, um, we get uh, using 16S uh, um, PCR, uh, um, qPCR um, in a 5 mil bronch uh, sample, it's about 1,000 copies. Um, in a healthy non-smoker, it's about tenfold higher than what we see over baseline, so maybe about 10 to the fourth copies per 5 mils of BAL. If you have disease, so interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or lung transplant, you can see the numbers go up. So give you an idea what do these communities look like compared to like the mouth. Um, and so this is from a study uh, in our uh, group in which we looked at a left BAL, right BAL, um, and then um, other, uh, and then the oral wash. And so they're color coded. So now here's the blue, which is the left BAL. And so is the centroid of all the BAL samples from our subjects. Here's the black, this is the right BL. You can see it doesn't matter if it's left or right, that, that the centroids are smack on top of each other in terms of what the populations look like. But here's the mouth, and the centroids are different. You can run statistics on it. And this, as a population, as a, as a collection, is, is significantly different than what you see. So the mouth is significantly different than 
the lavage. However, we talk about individual to individual variation, and so what we can also do is go back to these samples and measure a distance metric. So Bray Curtis, uh, Theta YC, Morisito Horn, you name it. But in this case, we did a Bray Curtis distance between samples. So the oral wash of a single individual versus their left BAL or the oral wash versus the right BAL. And what you see is a spread. So you see some individuals in which a rinse of their mouth and what we get out of the BAL is wickedly different. And you get some that are very similar. What does that mean? We don't know. But if we run some of these tests, like for example, the single-sided outlier test with it, here's one of the low Bray Curtis uh, uh, dissimilarity, so, so therefore they're very similar. And we go up here to the outlier test and you can see most of what we find, this is oral versus lung, uh, is being found in both. And so here's another example. Okay, everything's falling along the line. But what about a sample up here? You can see that what we find in the oral and what we find in the lung are very different. And there's another example of that. Okay, so we, so we don't know what it means when a healthy individual comes in and their bronchovillar lavage looks like an oral rinse or if it doesn't look like an oral rinse. Um, and again, we can't follow over time what that actually means. So what I think the field so far, the investigators are involved, because there's obviously, as you can imagine, there's some debate about sampling, about how to handle contamination, things like that. But I think what we can all agree on at this point is that when healthy, the microbial load in the lungs is low, and the BAL samples contain a predominance of bacteria taxa that's also found in the mouth. We know the bacterial diversity in the lungs is very low. Actually, we can use that to our advantage because we can do pyrosequencing, and we don't get that many types of OTUs, and we can actually take consensus uh, sequences from those OTUs from the 16S uh, R RNA gene amplicons, blast them backwards, and really come up with only one genus that it could be. And sometimes we can get as low as a species because there's no other options around it. Um, and so it's, ac and so, um, it, it's actually uh, very useful that way. So we, again, and we know in some individuals there are some differences suggesting that selective pressures can exist in the lungs for elimination, persistence, colonization, and growth. Now if we move to disease, so here's our healthy individuals in red. Here's individuals that had a lung transplant, and these are uh, bronchovial lavages, and this light green, hopefully you can all see it, um, is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see that if we call this kind of the normal cluster, you can see there's some lung transplants that are up in the normals, there's some IPFs that are up in the normals. If we focus on interstitial pulmonary fibrosis for just a second, so we'll call this the IPF, the healthy group, and this is the, the other group that doesn't look healthy. And we actually ask, who are the bugs that are there? Who are the bacteria that are there? Um, what you can see is in healthy individuals, we get this signature that not only we get, but they get it in Europe, they get it in labs all around the country, which is the dominant organisms that are coming out of a bronchial lavage are Prevotella, Vianella, and Streptococcus, and then quite often things like Fusobacteria um, and Neisseria. And so when we look at our quote unquote normal, our IPF1 group, we get the same sort of uh, um, organization. But if we look at this other group, suddenly we get Pseudomonas, we get Escherichia. So we're suddenly getting some gamma proteobacteria, some gram negatives that are coming in there. Now, interestingly, if we go look at the lung transplant recipients, um, our healthy controls, we actually found surprisingly an OTU that when we blasted it came back as Pseudomonas fluorescens. And interestingly, it was in our, only in the lung transplant. We have never found it in our healthy controls. And what it act, we find it only when, in our lung transplants, um, when the number, uh, when basically the relative ratio of Prevotella reads is low. So in other words, when it stops looking kind of like that mouthy, lungy sort of pattern, suddenly we get Pseudomonas fluorescens there in a large number of individuals. And so pseudomonas fluorescens should perk the ears of a few people in the audience because like Balfour and Jonathan Braun and anyone else who works with Crohn's disease uh, because you make antibodies to it uh, at a very high rate if you have Crohn's disease. Yet it's not a pathogenic organism, or at least it's not believed to be. So why is it there? Why is it in these lungs? And so to get to that question, so let me uh, summarize this point and say that when disease the microbial load uh, and the lungs increase in BAL samples now often contain numerous bacterial taxa. They're not found in the mouth, indicating that there are selective pressures in diseased lungs. 
So the challenge now to my question I just asked you is that studies only involving human subjects will never demonstrate causality no matter how large the cohort. And so in vivo animal studies, model organisms and in vitro experiments are needed to delineate the mechanisms. They have to work hand in hand. You got to go back. So, so translational research is iterative. You go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so we need support for animal models in the study of the human microbiome. Otherwise, how do we get back to this whole thing about the hygiene hypothesis and why these elements are on the different tip part of the balance? So to address the question, why is pseudomonas fluorescence there in the lungs, um, we'd been working for a long time on a model in which we can generate uh, allergic or uh, airway inflammation by multiple exposures to Aspergillus fumigatus spores. And so this shows you after four challenges, eight challenges, you get lots of leukocytes in the lungs, you get lots of inflammation, Th1, Th2, Th17, the lungs are kind of really messed up. Well, what we did is we went back and, and, and look at those animals and say, I wonder what happened to the lung microbiome of those mice. And if you go over here, this is, again, pyrosequencing. Look, we see this bloom of gamma proteobacteria that happened after four and eight challenges, this chronic in inflammation that's going on in the lungs. And if we look, we pull the OTUs out, the one that jumps out is pseudomonas fluorescence. Oh, granted, we got lucky, okay, because we didn't that wasn't the point at this point. We've actually gone in and taken the inflamed lungs and put pseudomonas fluorescence in it, and it does indeed like inflamed environments. And so it raises a question now, gamma proteobacteria, so pseudomonas fluorescence is non-pathogenic, but it's a gamma proteobacteria. Um, Escherichia is a, a gamma proteobacteria. Gram negatives, okay, so it's a common theme that we've actually seen also in the gut, that inflamed sites favor the growth of gram negative organisms. So the final case that I want to show you here to show you how our paradigms are changing and our thought process is changing is we've known, we've assumed for a long time that Klebsiella pneumoniae is an etiologic agent of pneumonia. However, as studies from our lab and my collaborators, we can take two different strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae that were isolated from patients with gram-negative pneumonia that responded to antibiotics, et cetera, put them into mice. One will kill the mice. And at the same dose, the other one, they'll, they'll walk away. I'm sorry, other way around. So one will kill the mice, one, one will walk away. Yet they came from human beings that had disease that responded. So what is going on there? So an interesting thing popped out of our studies of the lung transplant recipients. If we actually looked, so this is a single individual, two BALs over six months in time. At this point, they had a, they had a pneumonia by CT, uh, and they had all the other clinical symptoms. They were put on uh, ciprofloxacin, they recovered, they did much better. The culture was negative the whole way along the way, but when we looked at it, if this is a, a, the, from the pyro sequencing, you can see the sort of the normal cluster in here, and, and when they first came in, they were way different. And by the way, these individuals all have Pseudomonas aeruginosa up here. And, but after ciprofloxacin, they had a microbiome of their lungs that looked kind of normal. So what did that look like? Escherichia, just dominated by Escherichia, but it didn't grow out, okay? So we talk about unculturable bacteria or difficult in the GI tract, and there, there are things that you look at and you say, I don't recognize that name, you know? And so, but what about the ones whose names we do recognize that suddenly, I'm gonna argue in the airways, there's something different about microbial growth in the lungs that they are not able to be cultured under standard uh, microbiological process, uh, techniques that we use now, which means that the gap is that we need to understand the implication of culturable and non-culturable states of bacteria in the lungs. And also, I've been talking about bugs, where are they? Okay, so there's some work that's coming out now with Bill Cooks and things like that. I mean, and so who's alive, who's dead, where are they? But I just gave you an example of somebody who clinically responded to the fact that they've got a bug in their lung, but we couldn't grow it out. And we've actually now, we've got one set of pilot experiments where we've done, in a sense, the same thing. We've taken a, a culturable bug, put it in the, an inflamed lung, and watch it become unculturable. Um, I don't know what it means, though. So the bottom line is we need new cultivation strategies when we start to study the airways. So the overall challenge of the field you know, I, I can't underline this enough, okay? We need more consistent and supportive peer review of microbiome lung proposals. Granted, it's all aimed at my world, but, um, but 
But my point is, is that whether it's looking at the microbiome that's in the lung or the role that distal communication. So I, I guarantee that anyone who's trying to do microbiome nervous system or, or, or gut microbiome nervous system or gut microbiome, some other site other than locally, um, it, your proposals are going to be open for a, a field day um, because there's so many things that can be uh, poked holes at um, and it's hard for the field to move forward. We also have to accept that sampling of the lower respiratory tract in humans will be imperfect. I, I cannot even think of how we're going to solve that problem, okay, because of ethical reasons. Um, and so we're going to need to utilize animal models to close this gap. And so this is the research group uh, that uh, I showed uh, some of their work, uh, uh, both uh, in terms of in my laboratory, but then also my wonderful group of uh, collaborators at U of M. And so I thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Gary, for that great talk and for so clearly articulating some of the gaps and challenges in this area. Uh, so we do have time for a couple of questions. We have over there. So um, just in the spirit of, of a little bit of dialogue about this, I, I, we, none of us want to interfere with the exquisite re NIH review process, but, um, and I meant that sincerely, but uh, the, uh, it, I, I wonder if one of the things that we could talk about is the possibility of sort of a trans institute uh, review panel that was microbiome friendly. If I just, I would just introduce that idea in it. I, I, I've spoken to a, an awful right. lot of people that have so, related but, issues so, in terms of just, yeah. you know, are there panels out there that are sensitive to? So I'll throw my opinion out there, which is that my first thought is that I like that idea, but then I realize it's a double-edged sword, okay? And so, like, so I sit on study section, so while we're not supposed to talk about the F word when we review a grant, okay? Um, you know, the bottom line is, is that you know that when you sit on study section, if there's a pile of 100 grants that come in and, and you know that the institutes are, are funding at around 10 percent-ish, you know that 90 of those grants are going to go home and tell you to stay here. So now, what if we take everybody in this room and take all of your grants and put them into one study section? That means that 90 of you are going home. So there is a danger by lumping everyone together as opposed to moving across because if, if we at least keep things spread, then you're looking within an area, within a discipline, what's, the, in, a, in a sense, what's the relative importance of microbiome research versus a cell biology versus an epidemia, that sort of thing. But the problem is, and my big beef with the peer review system is, since when is peers three? Okay, you have a study section of 20-something people and that very first pass to get through, you have three people read? And then that's it, that can determine a fate. So basically it's like the UN Security Council, one individual can trash something. The, that part needs to be adjusted a little bit when you're dealing with interdisciplinary or risky research or discovery, okay? Because when it's not hypothesis testing and it's hypothesis generating, boy, they, it gets really risky. But I do think an active conversation needs to be, made, needs to be put up. That's probably a good topic for our later discussion, too. Um, we'll take one more question while our next speaker comes up. So regarding your non-culturable Escherichias, um, since they came from a pneumonia, which there may have been a biofilm, so in the biofilm field, t people talk about persisters. Do you think it could be something like that? Yes, I do. Actually, I think, I, I definitely think that that's, and, and so there's two things at play here. One is the idea of persisters, um, and then the other idea is that, um, you know, the microbial load, even in pneumonia, you know, even this is, is not necessarily high. And so what we may end up having is sort of in terms of ecological sense terms, like islands and, you know, or whatever, oases and deserts, okay, so um, within, within the lungs. But I do think that those are mechanisms, those viable but non-culturable mechanisms are, are going to be at play here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Ben Siang at the University of Michigan. He's going to enlighten us with a talk entitled The Microbiome in Infectious and Non-Infectious Gut Inflammation.